Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak to each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome State Senator Liz Kruger to the program today. Her district stretches from 19th Street to 103rd Street, from the East River to 8th Avenue, and includes Murray Hill, Midtown, including Times Square, the Upper East Side, Central Park, and the American Museum of Natural History. Her constituents include the very young and the very old, the impoverished and the incredibly rich, native New Yorkers and immigrants from all over the globe. Liz addresses their concerns as she copes with the politics of Albany. What a difference a few months makes, and what impact will recent events, including the changes wrought by the recent election, have on Albany's politics? Welcome. Thank you. It's been a terrible year for elected officials. I, I made this list. I'm going to run down okay. some of these things. Government, Governor David Patterson was forced by his own party not to seek a second term. Congressman Charlie Rangel yesterday, yes, yesterday uh, has been convicted of 11 House ethics violations. The scandal surrounding former Comptroller Alan Hevesy's pay-to-play operation continues to widen and play out. Former Senate Majority Leader Joseph Bruno was sentenced to prison for accepting illegal consultant fees while serving as Majority Leader. Congressman Gregory Meeks uh, was involved in a sort of questionable uh, a loan scandal, questionable loan involving his uh, mansion in Queens. State Senator Hiram Montserrat got booted from the Senate after beating his girlfriend. Former State Senator Pedro Espada is being investigated for allegedly looting some health clinics he runs, not to mention that he apparently didn't live in his senatorial district. Former Senate Majority Leader Malcolm Smith has been accused of some chicanery involving uh, some of his Senate staffers at a nonprofit he runs. A former city council member, Miguel Martinez, uh, was sent to jail for uh, theft of public money that was intended for nonprofit groups that he was involved in. And as we know, there's gridlock in Washington, in Congress in Washington. Is it safe to say that the public has just about completely lost faith in politicians, and maybe deservedly so? Certainly some people in politics are guilty of all these things. I would still argue to your public and to you, the majority of people who run for elected office do so for the right reasons and serve attempting to work in the best interests of their constituents. Nonetheless, you're absolutely right. There's a public perception that we're all a bunch of bums and shouldn't be there. Now, the catch is, as we just saw in this election, the solution is for the public to get more involved, find better people to run for elected office, run themselves, get more aggressively involved in the political process. But what we saw was that fewer people even bothered to vote. And I would argue that voting is the lowest common denominator of civic participation. So if we're not even voting, hence we're not getting involved in getting better people to run, in demanding better of our elected officials, this is not a good path to the right answers. I mean, yes, your stories are accurate. I worked very, very hard during summer to run a very fine young man against Pedro Espada. We won that primary. Gustavo Rivera will represent the Bronx district that the embarrassing Pedro Espada was the majority leader of the Senate from. And so there is a story of the community and activists and other elected officials saying enough is enough that community deserves better, we all deserve better. And so even though those examples are right, I'm still here today saying the answer is to be more activist and hold us to a greater standard of accountability. And we were saying just before we um, came on the set that, uh, that the voting rate in New York was the lowest in, in the, the country. country. Yes, ma'am. That's incredible, I find that really incredible. 
and very, very disturbing. I mean, we're the great state of New York. We're a state that it's made up when you were describing my district. We're a state that's made up of people who fight to get here from all over the world, right? We are the melting pot, the jumping off point for generations of new Americans um, leaving their own countries to come here for a better life and for better for their children. But where are we flunking the test mm -hmm. in making sure that their children and their children's children understand the critical importance of very active participation in democracy. So obviously voting, you know, if, if we want the bums out, we have to throw them out. We have to vote to throw them out. Aren't there also, there are ethics laws that are already in place. Why haven't they prevented all of this bad behavior? I think there's a couple of different answers, and people, you might agree with me or not. One, we need stronger ethics laws. There's no question about it. And Albany, Washington have had their successes and their failures in moving more aggressive ethics laws. I would argue if you're not ethical, you will find a way around whatever laws we pass. And so the real test and the real challenge is electing ethical people. Because yes, you should police us. You must police us. But better to get good people better in there. Better to the first get way. good people. And also, interestingly, I would argue we as elected officials need training in ethics. It's amazing how often people don't know where the lines are drawn technically. And I philosophically try to keep a large swath between myself and any line I might be aware of. But I know that I literally regularly call the ethics lawyer for the Senate and ask him, there's an actual person with the title, right. the ethics counsel, right. and I say, I've been asked to do X, or I'm thinking of doing Y, am I getting anywhere near a line? And they'll tell me, and if I think I'm getting anywhere near the line, I won't go near it. Yeah. But it's yeah. amazing to me how often I meet and talk to colleagues at the federal, the state, and the local level who really don't even know what the questions are to be asking. You know, now obviously in a major corruption scandal, you can't simply fall back on, oh, they didn't know that was against 12 laws. But it is also true that the same way as I think we need to have civics training of young people, I think we need maybe required classes in ethics law for new elected officials. And there's nothing with refresher like refresher courses. No, we make lawyers do refresher courses. We make professionals in all kinds of different um, specialty and licensed um, professions do continuing education classes. I think maybe one of the lessons are continuing education classes in ethics for is people there, in the like legislatures. A public, is there a published code of ethics that a new state senator gets and is supposed to read? Um, not really. There is there, you know, there's a number of different documents. There's the rules or procedures of the Senate or the Assembly. There's a small document on the rules and procedures of you know harassment and discrimination um, in hiring or handling staff. Um, but no, there's really not. Now I've actually gone looking for New York State's sort of standards of ethics through the lobbying commission and through some other commissions they named kept changing in New York State. And all you can find are advisory precedents that have been written, but there's no one place where you mm -hmm. can actually get this information. And there's a lot of gray area out there. Yeah, yeah. So I think a training manual would be great, but I also and a training, think- training, training course, but, training sessions. Continuing yeah. education program, right. because it's amazing how some people really don't realize that this is, well, fill in the blank, not okay. Right. So um, David Patterson will be going out as governor, I guess, uh, the end of the year, the beginning of the next year, probably one of the most unpopular governors <laughs> of all time. Um, but did anything get done in these last months of his tenure as governor? Has anything gotten done? Well, actually, I think that when people look back at the history of legislation, um, people will look at 2009-10 as having been an incredibly successful two-year period. Now, there's been so much 
you know, scandal and press about the clowns, the coup, the governor with this problem, the governor with that problem, that the public hasn't really focused, and the media certainly hasn't focused on all the really important legislation we passed in two years and the governor signed. So we got no fault divorce passed. Is that really passed? It's I guess. passed. <laughs> it's signed. Okay. It's law. Now, people don't realize, perhaps, unless they've had to go through a divorce situation in New York State, which a lot of us have, that the other 49 states have had no-fault divorce. A long time. Uh, the last state, state number 49, passed it 25 years ago. It took us wow. another 25 years to so pass So we got no-fault divorce. We got what are some no of the other things? Divorce. We got <clears throat> many new protections in our health insurance law so that they can't refuse you health insurance, they can't um, increase your rates without justifying it, um, they can't charge you more in co-payments than the actual cost of the service. The mm -hmm. bill I got passed, the concept that, you know, we know what co-pays are, but that they were getting away with charging a co-payment greater than the actual cost of the prescription or of the service being done. So we we passed many important health insurance reform. But wait a minute, my, my insurer just informed me that my insurance premium is going up, I computed 54% in January. And here's what the insurance companies are doing. Between the law we passed and the new federal legislation that goes into effect, they're saying, this is my last 10 months, my last 10 minutes to try to go crazy with increases. So they're trying to get away with all these skyrocketing increases before the new laws go into effect in January. Now, we believe that the state insurance commissioner actually will have the authority to say no or to reverse some of these actions by the insurance companies come January. Really? Yes. But you're absolutely right. I'm getting that information all over the place. Insurance companies are sending out notices, confusing notices, saying this is because of federal reform changes that we're increasing your insurance by 57 67 percent it's really outrageous wow wow well i i hope i hope there will be some prospect that that can be rolled back some because i was just stunned i said it's just disgraceful so uh we're going to have a a lot of new faces in albany starting in the new year does that make you more optimistic about the future and if so which faces in particular make you more optimistic? Well, we know that Andrew Cuomo is walking in with a strong mandate and agenda, but also some real challenges facing him. The economics of the country, the world, and here at home in New York State, you could say are depressing. Um, so he's facing between a nine and $11 billion deficit as a first time governor. Having nine billion? Yes, ma'am, uh -huh. $9 billion minimum deficit with his new first term governor budget proposal having to be out by the end of January. He said that he will not raise taxes. That's always an interesting ideological discussion in politics, but he has laid out that position for himself. So talking about $9 billion in cuts in a state budget when we don't have federal stimulus money, which we've had for the last two years to help us over the humps of bad economic times, is pretty damn scary, I yeah. have to tell you, yeah. um, and is a real challenge for the governor and the legislature. We have a brand new attorney general, Eric Schneiderman now. Eric's a close and personal friend of mine. We worked side by side in the state senate for the last eight years, so I'm very excited about seeing Eric as the attorney general. You know, he has a very broad understanding of the complexities of government and the importance of ensuring that laws are followed and that the people, the 19 million people in New York State, can be assured that they will have a responsive attorney in charge of making sure that when they come to the AG with complaints, about violations of state law or violations by the state's own agencies, that they will get a fair hearing and a rapid response. So it's a, a very diverse and very important job. We have a controller who has now been elected, um, Tom DiNapoli, as we know, first time out, was appointed through a process of the legislature when Alan Hevesy 
stepped down uh, upon actually very soon after winning re-election. And so I think that Tom, in his first few years, you know, faced the challenge of not having been an elected controller, and now he's an elected controller. So we have three strong Democrats at the top of state government, all of which, all of whom are facing real challenges. The legislature, we don't know the outcome yet of the state now, Senate races. Now, the Republicans, oh, oh, it's not clear yet? No, we still have three recounts going on okay, for the state Senate. Okay. Um, so the final number of Democrats versus Republicans, the yeah, actual no. people in their seats, we don't know yet in Nassau County, in Erie County, or in the middle of Westchester County. Voters, I think, almost uniformly will say, if you ask them what are their, their primary concerns right now, will say jobs, the economy. Is that an area that a governor or state legislature can really do anything about? Yes and no. In the very broad context of a world global economic meltdown, it's not that obvious what specific acts a legislature in a state capital can take to turn things around. But New York City and New York State, because they are to some degree global entities in their own right, can have a more active role in some major policy decisions compared to other states in the country. Um, international trade actually has a heavy focus here in New York. So we, even outside of the federal government, can play an activist role in improving international trade and international economic relations. I mean, CUNY, we're on CUNY TV. CUNY is an educator of people from all over the world. The future of this country, I'm sure, is dependent on improving our relationships with the world, having solid economic partnerships with countries all over the world. And in fact, many CUNY students who come here from around the world to train and to be educated, if they go back to their home country with a relationship and a knowledge of how we do business in America, are much more likely to have business relationships in the future. To some degree, New York City is a international city more than it's an American city. We are the trainers of people over the world. We're the trainers of doctors for the entire country and now more and more of the entire world. So yes, there are roles we can play as a state legislature in supporting the education um, and specific business niches with, with tentacles that go beyond our state and even our country. Um, there are important decisions we must make about infrastructure. I mean, why is New York City the economic engine for the state of New York? It's not that we're, it's not a debate that we are. We know we are. But what makes our city so strong and keeps it strong? And how can the state government and the city government ensure that we are keeping New York City competitive to remain the economic engine for the region in the 21st century. Infrastructure plays a huge role mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take a short break and we'll be back after this message. A los 39 años, le dio cáncer en la garganta por fumar. Pensé que me moría. Ahora tengo un hoyo permanente en la garganta. Nada nunca será lo mismo, ni siquiera las cosas más sencillas. I was born on an island where swimming was a way of life. I never thought that anything could keep me from the water. Then I go through cancer from a smoking cigarette and lost my voice. Now I have to cling to a hole in my throat. This water gets inside it. It will drown me. I used to love swimming.
Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with State Senator Liz Kruger of Manhattan. Is there any important legislation that is currently pending that really needs to be attended to, in your view? Um, there's endless number of bills that I think are critical because my mission as a legislator is to improve the laws in New York State. Right now, literally at the very end of this two-year session of the legislature, the governor may call us back before the end of the year to deal with a continuing budget deficit for the remaining part of this year. Um, he's talking about needing to cut another $300, $400 million out of the budget. Um, we technically need to do something called a budget cleanup bill that never happened. It sounds very boring, but you pass a budget which is thousands of pages, and then people go through and realize, oh, you made a bunch of mistakes, technical mistakes. It happens in every budget and mm -hmm. every government. We never did the cleanup bill, and some of them are actually pretty important technical changes, so we do need to pass that. Going into 2011-12, um, one of the huge issues before us is the sunsetting of rent regulation laws. And there are a million apartments here in New York City that are affected by rent regulation, rent control, rent stabilization laws. So that bill sunsets in, I think, June of 2011. The legislature and the governor must act to reform and renew that law before June. So I would say the discussions on that start day one when we get back to Albany in the new session. And as I was saying before, we don't really know who the majority in the Senate will be. I believe the Democrats will hold the majority. Do you? Yes. But again, we have three outstanding elections that are not done. We may end up in a 31-31 situation, which will require a power sharing arrangement, which has not ever been dealt with in mm -hmm. New York State. And some people think that it's not possible uh, to come to a power sharing arrangement. I personally believe if that's what the voters have ended up in the situation of giving us 31 Democrats, 31 Republicans, we better damn well figure out how to work together to move forward in 2011. Now for years, Albany has been criticized for the fact that, you know, all, all the business, or much of the business seems to be controlled by three guys in a room. Um, you know, the the majority leader of the Senate, Senate Speaker of the, the Assembly, Speaker of the Assembly and, the, and the governor. Has that changed any in the last year or do you or do you see it changing because of the new group of people in Albany? I do see it changing, um, particularly it changed in the Senate. The Senate had been controlled by the Republicans really since 1939 until 2008 when the Democrats took over. But we only took over with a slim majority, 32-30. And of course, during the coup, it was 31-31 for a little while. And as a result of, of this change in power and party, we changed the rules of the Senate, giving the, um, the rank and file members of the Senate, both parties, much more power to make things happen, to bring bills to the floor, to co-sponsor each other's bills without needing permission mm -hmm. from the leader. Um, so we did make some significant changes, some equalization of resources, and that has changed how the Senate works. Now, some people would say we became more chaotic than the Assembly, because the Assembly still has a very, very strong leader who controls the vast majority of anything that happens in the assembly. There's less chaos in the assembly. I think that's a fair statement. And in the Senate, we saw a decent amount of chaos that I believe was a combination of changing party leadership after you know, 70 years, as well as changing the rules to make it more democratic. democratic. You know, The reality of democracy is it's not all smooth and easy. It is a rocky road, and I think people watching the New York State Senate over the last two years try to evolve into a model, a new model, I think ultimately a better model, saw that rocky road in front of them. Mm -hmm. uh, local issue, uh, Mayor Bloomberg just appointed a new school's chancellor, Kathleen Black, who comes not from an education background, but from a the magazine, the publishing business. A lot of controversy over that appointment. How do you feel about it? 
but we passed a law giving the mayor mayoral control of the city school system. So I've looked very carefully at the law, and he technically has the authority to appoint anyone he chooses as the chancellor. But if they don't have particular education credentials, they do have to go before the state education commissioner right, get to a get a waiver. I have urged David Steiner, the education commissioner, to do a careful and public vetting of Ms. Black. I think that the population of New York City, the parents um, in the who send their children to school, the teachers, the administrators, all deserve to know something about Ms. Black and her credentials and how she approaches um, public education. This is, after all, the largest school system in the country. Our school system is actually bigger than most cities mm -hmm. in the country. Right. Um, so while I understand what the law says, because of the waiver reality, I hope that Commissioner Steiner will put together a distinguished panel of people to be his committee to make recommendations to him, and they will do a thorough vetting in public because I think we all deserve to know where Ms. Black stands on many issues. And right now, because of the way the mayor went through no public process, um, everyone has questions. So she may be qualified to be a great next chancellor of the city of New York. I just think everybody needs to learn more. Our thanks to State Senator Liz Kruger for joining us today. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.